It never struck you as strange that this man just showed up to save you? No. No, I didn't. The Crowded Room on Apple TV is so good. Tom Holland's character is loosely based on the real case of Billy Milligan, a man with dissociative identity disorder arrested for a string of violent offences who became the first person to have the insanity defence upheld in America on the basis of a DID diagnosis. I'm going to do a few episodes on this season because it's a really fascinating window and depiction of this complicated and underappreciated and in some people's mind controversial disorder and we'll be discussing this question over time. Can dissociation absolve criminal responsibility for an act? Trust me, this is really good. Ready? Let's crack on. Hey, stop! Danny? Danny, shoot! Danny, come on! Danny! Danny, shoot him! Knowing the premise of the show, which is all in the intro and it's well publicised in all their promo materials, so I'm not giving you any spoilers by telling you it's based on the Billy Milligan case. The question is obviously whether this is real and as we see it, or if what we're seeing here is the manifestation of another personality or an alter. Though it's important to remember that people with DID don't necessarily experience their alters in a separate physical space where they're a friend or an acquaintance as opposed to them. Though if they depicted it in any other way, it'd basically give the game away straight away. Bullets flying, glass everywhere, winged one guy, some lady took one in the leg. Kid's just a little good luck shy of a murder charge. What about the girl, Ariana? It's a pretty name. There's no sign of her either. I'm thinking then he offed her and the landlord. This is what happens when your partner reads one book on serial killers. A serial killer is somebody who has perpetrated at least three murders, often in a reproducible and uh, quite ritualistic pattern. Similar victims, similar types of killings under similar circumstances. Some have tried to group serial killers into classifications. Those that see themselves as visionaries doing this for a greater purpose. Those that are very mission orientated, hedonistic, or all about power and control. And while some serial killers have been diagnosed with chronic psychotic disorders, like the Yorkshire Ripper, for the most part, the main mental disorder present in this cohort is antisocial personality disorder, often with prominent traits of, of callous unconcern that we would define as psychopathy. Danny? How are they treating you? It's like everybody else, I guess. Slightly evasive. Well, I'm just here to talk. But what happened with Ariana, I know. Do you know where she is, Danny? No. Like I told the police, I haven't seen her since what happened on the street. Well, the police can't find her either. For TV purposes, the, this interview is obviously getting straight to the nitty gritty. If you're a mental health professional off of real life though, this is not how you would start a consultation. You'll get to the point of asking the really heavy questions, ones that people might be reluctant to answer and particularly to answer truthfully. The only way you get to that point where then people answer and give you reliable answers is if you spend the time building some trust and you take it step by step by step. Trying to catch people out or trap people to get them to confess to having done something will have the reliability then question in court. I wasn't a very popular kid at school. Turns out sad and moody didn't do me any favors at home either. And we do ask a lot about people's childhood. Anybody that's seen a mental health professional knows that we always ask. When we ask about it, how much we ask and how much information is enough is completely dependent on the person and the context in which we're seeing them. It's important to appreciate though because we are a collection of our early life experiences. Our past shapes our present and our future. Many risk factors for criminality and many risk factors for mental illness, some of which overlap, can be traced back to your early childhood. But talking about the past, particularly talking about past traumas, can be very re-traumatizing and potentially emotionally destabilizing for people that otherwise struggle to have those emotional coping skills to manage intense day-to-day -day emotions, let alone unpacking this stuff that you've suppressed and put to the back of your mind. Suppressed, repressed. Repressed is the right term. It's good. Thanks. Is it Adam? Mm-hmm. You really miss him a lot, huh? 
Yeah, sometimes. Not all the time. We know where this is headed. He'll go to hospital at some point, right? Is a DID diagnosis in the criminal justice system. Knowing and understanding his strengths and his skills, like being able to do art so wonderfully like that, is really useful. And I'm a huge fan of practical forms of therapy like art therapy. Many people with different mental illnesses have something that's called alexithymia, the inability to recognize and then describe emotional states. And using art as a, uh, a mode of expression and then a launching pad for describing discussion about someone's mind and the context in which they've done this piece of art is so useful. And we weren't just identical on the outside, we were inseparable. Can you tell me about him? Do you want to talk about what happened to Adam? Do you want to talk about it is a really great way of phrasing it. It gives the person agency and some control over what information is shared. It invites people to talk about it. It tries to imply that it's a safe space to talk about it and the person wants to hear about it, but without backing them into a corner and necessarily coercing someone and pressuring somebody into talking about something they're not ready to talk about yet. So I really like that. Yitzhak, even the name sounds exotic. Did it strike you as strange him being there? What do you mean? Did he seem at all out of place in your suburban neighborhood? Oh. Danny? I think it suck would have been pretty much out of place in any neighborhood. That could be a nice little depiction of a flashback, which is different to a memory. A flashback comes on suddenly, stops you in your tracks and makes you feel that you're immersed back in that traumatic situation from your past. It's like you're reliving it. It's all encompassing rather than just being a memory that's in your mind. Both can be terrifying. One isn't better or worse than the other. Both are diagnostically important when we consider conditions like post-traumatic stress disorder, but the treatment of memories versus flashbacks can be quite different, so it's important to distinguish them. It never struck you as strange that this man just showed up to save you. No, no, I didn't. It's interesting because fear is the dominant emotion for most of my patients, if not all my patients with mental illness, even if it manifests with anger and antisocial behaviors to try and mask those vulnerabilities that come with feeling frightened. So she's trying to dig a little bit deeper into the emotional states that underpin a lot of his experiences. This is good so far. So let me ask you again, where's Ariana? I told the police I don't... What happened to Yitzhak? They're not the only people close to you to disappear, are they? What happened to Adam? Dissociative identity disorder is a recognized mental disorder, and it's the current diagnostic framework for what was once termed multiple personality disorder, which is not akin to schizophrenia. They're completely different. Dissociation is this broad term we use for a disconnection between our mind and our body, a disconnection from our thoughts, our memories, our identities. It's a, a very primitive psychological defense mechanism to try and shut off our mind in the face of intolerable sort of psychic distress. However, like most if not all unconscious defense mechanisms chronic dissociation is harmful to our health if we're not in control then we're not actually equipped to be able to deal and face the danger that's in front of us it makes us more vulnerable dissociative identity disorder is one manifestation of dissociation periods of disconnection from your core identity that core identity disintegrates and you form these new personalities in response to different experiences that usually represent certain underpinning mental functions we might have more impulsive personalities we might have more calm and calculated personalities more emotional ones, more callous ones, more pro-social ones. In some people's minds, it remains a controversial diagnosis. Personally, I completely believe in it. I think if you question the validity of DID as a diagnosis, you have to question the validity of all dissociative disorders. And I don't think anybody disputes the legitimacy of dissociative amnesia, fugue states, depersonalization, derealization. I couldn't go home. Why? I guess my stepfather thought that I was trouble. We were on a collision course, him and I. What happened between the two of you? What are you not telling me? It was just time for me to move out, that's all.
evasive, but it's a start. So we're starting to see whether he's maybe been exposed or a victim of domestic violence, and whether that's a potential risk factor for future violence, given what he's been arrested for. The literature is completely scant about whether male victims of domestic violence are more likely to commit significant violence in the future. Most of the research has focused on female victims of domestic violence because the most common way it comes to fruition is male perpetrators and female victims. However, all forms of abuse in our childhood and adolescence, so whether it's neglect, physical violence, sexual violence, uh, emotional abuse, are risk factors for a range of different mental disorders in the future. Sometimes she would hit the wall so hard I thought she was going to break her hand. But mostly she just cried. And then the next day it was as if nothing had ever happened. So is this the part of his personality or is this the altar that allows him to express these more negative or distressing emotions? The altars that manifest during periods of dissociation, they, they come from us. It's all us. It's a disintegrated mind manifesting in lots of different altars, which is our mind projecting the unconscionable onto these new identities. It's all us, but a disintegrated us. What kind of things? Errands, maybe. Is it possible that you did some things that maybe you don't remember? So possible periods of dissociative amnesia is what she's going to be getting at, which can present when alters manifest. Do you remember everything you've ever done? I must stress, obviously, that I don't have the ID. Uh, my experience is secondhand through patients that I've worked with, and I suppose thirdhand from what I know from the academic literature. So anybody with lived experience that needs to correct me or wants to add to anything that I've said, please put it in the comments as long as you feel comfortable. Many people will have dissociative amnesia while there's an alter present. So these alters manifest when your core personality is otherwise in a, a sort of amnesic fugue state, where anterior grade amnesia occurs, so we don't lay down the new memories, so then when the core personality comes comes back out, they probably have no idea about anything to do with the altar. All of the memories of what's happened is repressed into the unconscious. But over time, those unconscious memories might find their way creeping into the conscious. But for many people, while they're not aware of these altars, these are simply blank spots in people's memory. <laughs> I thought you said you were going out. And I thought you knew there are no drugs in this house. Oh. Danny, Danny, you didn't tell us there no weren't drugs. supposed to be drugs you know, in that we house. We weren't even going to bring it. You know, it wasn't know. actually, it was Johnny's idea. It was Johnny. So are these the alters that he is aware of? Those unconscious memories can creep into the conscious, so awareness does happen. That's where the alters get given names. They sometimes kind of become part of internal monologues. There's conversations that can happen between them. Our conscious mind doesn't feel capable of dealing with. Some may take on a more parental role. Some might take on a protective role. Some may be a friend. It's us projecting different mental functions onto these alters because it's too difficult and too potentially emotionally destabilizing to integrate them uh, as one at a conscious level. You understand that you're describing somebody who is profoundly unstable. What was she doing at night, Danny? Do you know? I didn't at the time. Profoundly unstable is a meaningless term for anyone exhibiting a period of acute emotional distress. It's also quite pejorative. Be specific and compassionate, please. We can be both. This is a little intro. This is setting us up and introducing us to some of the alters, I think, and a depiction of different ways to try and start conversing about this and how professionals can start understanding this human being that's behind the illness. I am looking forward to watching more of these. Let me know what you thought in the comments below and I will see you for the next episodes very soon. Love you, bye.